Um, I first of all want to welcome you to this second event in the series of two that we started back in December with the Chamber of Commerce. Our intent with these two events was to highlight charter schools and our first event was Charter 101 where we brought in John Danner from Rocket Ship and also had Chris Barbick with the Achievement School District and a panel of Tennessee charter school leaders to talk about what are charters, uh, what do they do, how do they operate, what are we learning from them. Um, this second event was really envisioned as an opportunity to talk about shared practices and the collaboration that can come when charters and non-charters work together. Little did we know when we were envisioning what that event would look like that we would have the opportunity to hear from the folks we will talk to today. Um, there was an opportunity that came about through um, the Tennessee Charter School Incubator and in partnership with Metro Nashville Public Schools to pair charters and non-charter teachers together uh, for a cha shared practices fellows program. And we were honored to be able to host them on our campus for the past four months to let them work on what we're calling intractable problems that they all share in their particular schools and areas. These fellows applied. Um, it was sort of an extensive selection process. They had lots of things they had to do to be selected. And then they worked in this collaborative book study as well as visiting each other's schools and working together on common problems. So you are going to hear from the panel today that will talk about these common problems and what they learned from each other and hopefully what we can learn about the opportunity that we have if we truly collaborate with one another. Um, in the midst of that, I learned that the Charter School Incubator was bringing in a fantastic person and his name is Todd Dixon and we're going to have an opportunity to hear from him in just a moment. Um, I want to say a few words about Todd before we have a formal introduction from Mark Hill. I had an opportunity to go out to Summit Prep last week and spent a, a day with Todd visiting Summit Prep and then getting an opportunity to talk to people who know Todd from Stanford University and I have to admit it was a great day. Uh, Julie Simone and I were there and spent the day learning about um, Redwood City, uh, learning about the area and, and getting to know what Todd is doing in that area. I have to admit the school is very diverse very high performing and very impressive. So I know we are going to benefit from Todd's collaborative spirit and the humility and the passion that he's going to bring to our city. So we will definitely be a better city for having Todd here working in our community. Um, it was a delightful day and I know you will learn a lot from his comments this morning. Uh, without further ado, let me turn over the microphone to Mark Hill who will bring some comments from the chamber and formally introduce Todd Dixon. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. I want to say a word about Lipscomb University and Dean McQueen. It is remarkable from the outside looking in to see a college of education deeply involved in the reform issues of the day, not just involved, but leading the discussion such as we are this morning, whether it's Teach for America, whether it's charter schools, whether it's tackling the tough issues, whether it's working in partnership with the Metro schools, you all are on the forefront and just want to let you know that we all see it and we appreciate it and thanks for the work that you do every day here at Lipscomb. You know, the work of the Nashville Chamber is supported by our membership and our sponsors. We can't do what we do without our members and our sponsors. So I do want to take a moment to recognize what we call our pivotal partners, which is a partnership at the very highest level of the chamber that makes all of our events and activities possible. That's Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee, Community Health Systems, and also Delic U.S. Holdings. Together, they help us at the Nashville Chamber take a lead and get involved in public education. The Tennessee Charter School Incubator and Mayor Carl Dean announced in January that National Charter School Leader Todd Dixon would be coming to our city to start a network of high performing charter schools in 2014. The incubator will host Dixon as its senior fellow for two years while he finalizes his plans to create a charter management organization of eight to ten college preparatory public charter schools focused on measurable outcomes. The schools will be located in Nashville and Dixon intends to submit a charter application to the Metropolitan Nashville Public Board of Education to open at least one school in 2014. 
Dixon is executive director of Summit Preparatory Charter High School in California. It's well known for educational successes with economically, ethnically, and racially diverse populations. In fact, in 2010, Newsweek, named, uh, Newsweek magazine named Summit Prep as one of the top 10 transformational schools in the country. And the school's model was also highlighted as an education solution in the highly acclaimed documentary, Waiting for Superman. Since 2007, some 96% of Summit graduates have earned exceptions to four-year colleges. Dixon will join the Tennessee Charter School Incubator this July. The incubator will provide training, resources, and support for Dixon as he builds his professional network here in our city and develops plans for his charter management organization. So at this time, please join me in welcoming Todd Dixon. Thanks so much, Candace and Mark, for the great introduction. Um, I'm so excited to get here. Uh, we're moving to Nashville in, a, in about a month from now from San Francisco, and it's a great pleasure to be here today, and we're really looking forward to being here in a month. I, we have a four-year-old and a two-year-old at home, and I actually overheard them in the bathtub the other day practicing saying to each other, how y'all doing? <laughs> and so I, th I think they're all officially ready to get down to Nashville. We're really looking forward to it. Um, I'm going to spend about 10 or 12 minutes talking with you about this idea of collaboration and I'll start with some of the successes and failures we've had with collaboration at Summit Prep in California and then we'll zoom out for a little bit to talk a little bit about some of the national trends that we see with collaboration between charter schools and districts and then we'll zoom back down to Nashville and talk about some of the exciting possibilities that I see here with collaboration. Um, Summit Prep started about 12 years ago. It was, it was a, an idea within the community members and they wanted to bring, as Candace mentioned, a, a really diverse group of students together in a college prep environment so that they could all learn from each other in both academic and non-academic settings, but have the, the rigor bar extremely high for all of them. Uh, we've worked incredibly hard to meet that mission over the last nine years and I think we still have a lot of room and for growth in a lot of places we can get better, but we're really proud of where we are today. I think the most important stat to me is that we graduate three times as many kids college ready as the neighboring schools around us. And we graduate seven times as many low income students ready for college as the neighboring schools around us. Um, and for us that's the key to our mission is getting every kid ready for college. And um, we bumped that 96% up I think this year to 97 because we, for the first time we've had 100% of our kids accepted to college this year. Um, the hope of the charter school movement was that you would have innovative schools that were, had a good successful track record and that the district schools around them would come look and they would share best practices and say what's going on in these schools and then those best practices would be shared back into the districts. Unfortunately what we saw in the early stages of summer prep is that not only did that not happen, almost the exact opposite happened is that we started to have um, a lot of our accomplishments were talked about in the press and the district ended up spending a lot of time and energy trying to discredit those accomplishments course made us frustrated and then the, we started to we started to see the separation and polarization um, of a charter school camp in a district, pro-district and pro-charter school camps. Uh, and it was very non-collaborative. It was really competitive in an ugly way where it made collaboration almost impossible. And that, that came to a head in 2008 when as a, as a um, CMO we decided to start a second charter school in our district because there was so much demand. And we submitted the charter to the district and the district actually denied that charter. And of course we were upset and tensions rose and then we appealed it to the county and they, they denied it again at the county and the tensions rose again and we we, we appealed it for a last chance to the state. And it was right before we were about to uh, hear the state was going to hear our appeal. And tensions were probably at an all-time high for us in the district that one of my very favorite grandparents from Summit came to visit me. And she has two grandkids at Summit and she had a third on the way. And she sat down with me and she said, I just want to understand what, what's all this fuss about this Everest thing. And so I sat down with her and I said, well, you know, there's different tax codes for charter schools and districts and, and there's different board governance structures and the finances, depending on how you look at them, there, there, there's different perspectives on that. And at some point I said, and it's pretty complex and her name was Mary Watson and Mary put her hand down and she, she looked right at me and she said, Mr. Dixon, it's not complicated to me. And she said, I don't care about tax structures. I don't care about the governance board. 
I don't care what you call these schools. You can call them a charter school. You can call them a public school. You can call them a comprehensive school. You can call them a beauty school if you want. He said, the one thing that I care about is going home, looking my babies in the eye, and telling them that they're going to be going to a great school. Um, so every so often in, in your life, I think you get really good feedback at the right time from the right person. And that was one of those moments for me that caused me to step back and say, and really look at what are we doing in these warring camps um, and, I, and I felt myself kind of fold up my tent and from the pro charter camp and walk and start kind of in honor of Mary Watson a, a camp that I call the pro great schools camp which is really about how, how do we really just focus on great schools and, and stop the warring between the two camps um, I want to expand out now to talk about that idea at a more of a national level and this is a graph that I borrowed from Don Shalvey, who is the former CEO of Aspire Public Schools in California and now works with the Gates Foundation. He spoke at Stanford about a month ago, and I, I, he was using this example. Um, you can see the, the vertical graph is competitive to collaborative, and then on the horizontal it goes from traditional to innovative. Um, I would substitute also in there that I would say unhealthy competition at the bottom, and you could also think about healthy collaborative competition at the top. Um, the original theoretical vision of charter schools was that they would spend the majority of their time in the top left quadrant, is that they would be places where there'd be lots of innovation and then there would be lots of collaboration, kind of an R&D wing of the public school system, where there would be lots of opportunities to try things, see what worked, and then bring it back to the public school systems. In the first 20 years of the charter movement, I think what we're actually seeing is that most of the time and energy has been in the bottom right quadrant, um, where it's been pretty intense competition. Um, and the schools, sometimes due to that competition, are actually just trying to do what traditional schools do, but they're just trying to do it better. And they're doing it under very intense competitive circumstances. Um, what I think we're actually starting to see is there's some evidence coming out. I'm going to give you about six examples of this that are, that are happening across the country that are showing that I think we're moving into a new era um, and we're moving from unhealthy competition into healthy competition and collaboration in a few important areas around the country. And I think Nashville's one of them. It's one of the big reasons why I'm here. Um, one of the first interesting reasons that's related to Nashville is that I think you're seeing a lot of these TFA ed reformers that came in 20 years ago, right when TFA and the charter movement started. They're in their early 20s. 20 years later, they're in their mid 40s, and they're starting now to get high position power, powerful positions in districts across the country. And there's some examples. Uh, Kaya Henderson in DC is the chancellor of DC, and Cami Anderson in New Jersey. And then we have two right here in Tennessee with Kevin Huffman and Chris Barbeck have now moved into district positions and state level positions within kind of the system. And, and I think this is really important because I've seen at least three articles over the last two weeks talking about, and I, I saw all three of those speak at the New School Venture Fund in San Francisco about two weeks ago. Their conversations are very different. It's, it's not the conversation that you hear about, we've got to compete and, and break the system. It's more about how are we going to collaborate and work within the system and with those schools, but still have healthy competition with the charter schools. And so it's a, it's a very different conversation than even two years ago, which I think the, the camps peaked with waiting for Superman, in my opinion, and we kind of lived through that at Summit Prep. Um, this is a big shift, in my opinion, because it really shows that Instead of being external charter discussion, it's internal charter discussion, and it's part of a collaborative uh, discussion about how to make great schools. The second thing I wanted to point out is a change in vocabulary, and this might be a little hard to see, I apologize, but this is a something from the Center for Reimagining Public Education, and it's, there's little red dots up there that they've used a term called portfolio districts, and that's really starting to be a common term in education over the last two years. Um, and you can see one of those dots is Nashville, and there's, there's about 15 of them right now in the country that are really what they consider a portfolio district. Um, and a brief definition of portfolio district would be districts that are really starting to say, let's include the management of charter schools in our whole picture of how we manage a district instead of saying we're going to manage a district and then deal with this charter school problem they're really saying how are we going to manage charter schools and district schools together in order to get produce as many great schools as possible um, Nashville is one of those areas which I'm really excited about 
the Gates Foundation also, there's blue dots up there. Um, Gates is encouraging with, this is encouraging uh, districts to um, collaborate with charters and district schools through compacts. And that's another one, again, that Nashville has done. It's one of the rare ones in the country. What's exciting about Nashville, if you look at this map, is that they're one of maybe five in the whole country that have a blue and a red dot up there and so they're really on the leading edge of what could be great public education if we continue on this path. In California, and a smaller example that this is something that we've done at Summit, is that we've partnered with Stanford University and Candace and Julie came to see some of this work is that Stanford University and the universities there are partnering with charter schools and district schools and bringing programs together in order for those schools to collaborate together. And we're, we're a partner school with about six district schools and six charter schools. And we meet six times a year um, as groups and we do grand rounds at each other's schools to figure out what's working in each school, what's not working, how can we, how can we collaborate and innovate across schools. Um, Right here in Nashville, I think there's another exciting uh, partnership with Lipscomb and I hope, and with the Ayers Foundation, with the Leadership Institute, as far as I understand, will then also bring together charter and district leaders to think about how can we have healthy competition and collaboration amongst the schools. And today is the most important, in my opinion, is collaboration between teachers. And so I'm really excited about that and I'm very excited to hear the teachers' solutions to these intractable problems. I'll be taking careful notes to figure that out. Um, I believe the future of public education is going to be in the hands of the charter and or to the cities and the districts that actually spend their time and energy in this top left quadrant. Uh, the ones that are able to do that incredibly well are going to be the cities that other cities look to to be the examples of education reform in this country. I think Nashville's poised to be one of those. Um, poised is a lot different than actually doing it, so I think we're right where we should be, and I'm really excited to come down here and be um, uh, someone that's going to work incredibly hard to help make that happen in this city. Um, there's going to the next phase of charter schools, which I hope to be a part of, is going to have some really incredibly innovative models, and I think there's going to be some highly successful models, and I think the best districts are going to be ready to figure out how to collaborate with those models, how to help innovate with those models, and how to encourage more innovation within the district schools and the charter schools. Um, and I'm really excited to be here, and I'm going to give everything that I have to make sure that that happens here in, the, in this great city, and we're really excited to come down here. And my, my hope will be 20 years from now we could look at this city and say that we really could look just like Mary Watson did with her kids, as look every family in the eye and say, don't worry, you're going to a great school. So thanks so much for having me this morning. I want to thank you, Todd, that uh it's gratifying and nice actually to hear an outside perspective uh, to, to verify and ratify what it is that we have been talking about and trying to do. And um, when you talk about Gates encouragement, it's exactly this kind of thing. This is a, a Gates funded activity that comes immediately out of our compact together. And um, it really is the work that I think we need to be doing. Um, and so I, l thank you very much for, for putting such a careful eye on innovation and collaboration. And I look forward to uh, working with you in the future. Uh, I was just going to say a few words about collaboration, but it's been said more eloquently. Uh, and what I will say is that when I first uh, took the job at the charter school's office, uh, I got exactly one question all the time, and that was, uh, what are we learning from charter schools? And I answered it pretty much the same way all the time. And I said, um, you know, really that, that notion that district schools are learning from charter schools is a notion that while important and interesting um, is overplayed and I thought it was overplayed in these warring camps on each side of the question. I thought it was overplayed by opponents of charter schools. Hey, they're not teaching us anything. They're just doing what we're doing, doing it better, harder, faster. There will be burnout and churn. And then it was overplayed by charter school advocates at the same time. You know, we're going to find the secret sauce and we're going to sprinkle that on and all the schools are going to be perfect schools as a result. And, and, you know, we came quickly to the same conclusion that it's great schools that we want. It doesn't matter what the type of those schools is and that when competition is healthy, everyone's better and when it's unhealthy, everyone's worse. Out of that and out of our experiences over the last three years, we have been very fortunate to select um, 
charter partners who are part of the district, and a, a number of them are here today, who believe in that and who uh, support that and who give to that. And in the process, we've been very fortunate as well uh, from district leadership, community support, board leadership to be moving in that direction in terms of our district schools at the same time. And so our, our district run schools and our district charter schools are beginning to have more porous walls and that's the beginning of that kind of collaboration that I think will actually get to the teacher level and affect day-to-day uh, -day operations, not insofar as we think that we're going to find the magic solution but insofar as we're going to change education so that it'll be what the education that our children deserve for the world they're going to live in is really all about. I think fighting over what education looked like 10 or 15 years ago and which of us does better at that is really missing the point. It's that collaboration and innovation at the same time that drives us forward. Uh, the history of good ideas, I've been studying a lot about innovation lately, and the history of good ideas uh, led to an ideological clash in the 20th century between those who thought that the way you get good ideas is you have big government investment in research and development. And while that can be tracked to have produced good ideas and driven economic development, space exploration, and, and, and things of that nature that have dramatically changed the world we live in, it's not exclusive and it's not in and of itself driven those things. And then there's the other side that, that believes, well, really innovation comes from those who are chasing the profit motive and that the, the profit and the ability to sell and the ability to reap return on those investments leads to innovation and good ideas. Also true, also responsible for tremendous breakthroughs, but also an incomplete piece of the puzzle. When you really look at the history of good ideas, what you find is Good ideas come from networks. Good ideas and innovations come from people bumping into each other with different ideas where they exchange the ideas and instead of exchanging a dollar for a piece of equipment, you exchange two ideas and you each have a third idea that's better than the one that was there in the first place. And ownership breaks down in that, in that regard to allow for innovation. Uh, and Historians who study that look at the rise of the city as the opportunity for people of different backgrounds and different ideas to come together and clash and, and innovate from there. And I think that's exactly what we're creating in a small way here. And that's why I really appreciate uh, Lipscomb University stepping up to be a part of this, designing this curriculum and putting it in place so that we could have uh, teachers who are actually working together and learning from each other in a way that we usually don't have time to do. You have these groups sometimes in your schools, and when they're there, they're important. Those are important networks, but networks across schools are also important. And so connecting those ideas in this way is a tremendous opportunity, and I hope it'll be just the beginning of more to come. I would be remiss if at this point I didn't make a pitch to say that because this is being undertaken on uh, the generosity of the Gates Foundation, uh, with regard to our initial compact seed money to continue this kind of activity, we will need funds in the future. Uh, I think we're getting a high return on that investment. I'll leave it to you today to uh, judge the return on that investment, but I think it's strong, uh, and I think it's going to make a difference in schools across the district and eventually across the city and across the country. And I hope that we'll be able to continue and, and to expand and draw from what we've learned to expand this, this kind of program and kind of collaboration uh, even further in future years. I won't pass the plate, but I think you all know where to find me if you would like to be a part of that endeavor. All right, finally, I think I thank the Gates Foundation for the, the funding that made this possible, certainly the Charter School Incubator and its participation in the Compact and uh, also Justin Testerman in particular and his uh, willingness to just jump in and roll up his sleeves and try to do whatever it takes to make sure that collaboration and cooperation happens uh, have been instrumental in getting this done. We wouldn't be here without them. Um, and, and I want to thank Lipscomb uh, officially and formally. Mark already hit on the the head, the degree to which the, the university and the people in this department contribute dramatically to what's going on in this city and education. Uh, they do it willingly and selflessly, and I appreciate it personally and professionally. I try to say so every chance I get, uh, but could never thank them enough. Uh, and in particular, Dr. Nicholas, for designing the course and, and working with the students. I hope it was a great experience for you. I believe great teaching happens when teachers also benefit from the experience. So I hope that ha happened for you as well. Uh, and I'm sure that it did. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing the results and, and learning from this and seeing how we can proceed forward. But most of all, I want to thank the teachers because without you doing this, it wouldn't be happening. It's all well and good for us to sit
outside of your classrooms and say, wow, wouldn't it be great to come up with a space where they could collaborate and have share ideas and, and really get down to the nitty gritty of what does it mean to say we want great schools regardless of their type? What does that mean in day-to-day -day experience and how do we get that done? And um, you all responded to the call. You responded quickly to the call. Uh, and you responded through the semester. And, and I know that that comes at an expense because you have a lot of work to do. And the work that you do is incredibly important. I hope that this work was also enriching for you. I hope that it also has made you more effective in the work that you do. Uh, and I hope that it has broadened your horizons somewhat. Uh, I will be calling on you to share those experiences. And I look forward to having many opportunities to do so for Formally, but I know that informally the way you share with your colleagues and the way that you share with your students will be forever impacted one way or another because of the experience and that's the difference that really matters uh, in what we're doing. So let me say thank you to you personally. And it's at this point then that I'm going to introduce you and ask Dr. Nicholas to come up and help me in awarding you a token of your participation and our thanks. First we have uh, Jared Hum from Jerry Baxter. And if you'll just stay up here and, and we'll give him a rousing chorus of applause at the end and we'll have a team picture here at the end. Why don't you just stay up there for a minute. Uh, Declan Tansy from Lead Academy. Sheena Newbill from Smithson Craighead. Kimberly Vaughn from John Early. <laughs> Kathy Anderson from Thurgood Marshall. Misty Caldwell from Kip Academy. Michelle Lucas, Thurgood Marshall. Thanks. Mindy Norman, KIPP Academy. Carly Driscoll, Jerry Baxter. Daya Spahn from Graymar. and Luana Baltimore from Thurgood Marshall. Thank you all for participating and thank you for the hard work that you put in. Let's give them a blast. <laughs> now we'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Nicholas for the panel. While they're coming up, let me uh, just express thanks for the opportunity to work with them. Uh, I told Alan before we started, this has not been work at all. This has just been a sheer pleasure to be able to spend time with them. I read a statistic uh, a couple weeks ago out of a, uh, some recent research that was done about collaboration among teachers that was a little bit staggering, although instinctively I guess I knew it to be true. Basically, the research indicated that the typical teacher spends about 3% of his or her school day collaborating with other teachers. I want that to sink in. Just 3%. Good things happen when teachers have time to come together and talk. And so this has been a real pleasure to watch them do that, and they've done it beautifully. They're very passionate about the work that they do in their individual schools, and they're also very passionate about working with kids in general and helping them learn what they need to learn to, to live and be productive in the 21st century. Let me add just a little bit to what Candace said about how we did this. As Alan indicated, uh, this, we, we put this together fairly quickly, 
This was about a two month experience that we were able to work in and it did come during a very busy time of the school year for them as they were preparing for TCAPs and other things. So I, I really appreciate the effort that they gave to it. We met on four occasions for dinner and guided conversation. A lot of things happen when you meet together over dinner that are productive. And so that, that was a very positive experience as well. Initially, we set them up in teams, as has been indicated, pairing charter and public. And as we began this, we had them do a kind of a modified SWOT analysis, looking at their individual schools for strengths as well as weaknesses within their teams. And through their discussion then together, they honed it in on a problem that they wanted to research and look at. They did site visits at one another's schools. They were given iPads as kind of an incentive to help them here with this collaborative process that was going on. We did a book study together, a book uh, called Collaborative Leadership, authored by Hank Rubin, that talks about collaboration not only from an educational standpoint, but from a business standpoint. And then we shared just a number of articles, kind of along the themes of best practices in education, uh, along the theme of collaboration, as well as how to use that iPad effectively in education. And so they have come together uh, a couple weeks ago. They've shared among themselves their research on the problems. And we want to do that for you just very quickly this morning, as well as some other observations in the time that we have remaining. So Declan, we're going to begin with you. We'll just move down the row here. And I'd like for you, if you would, to describe each of you what your team focused on and kind of what you learned <coughs> relative to your problem. Okay. Good morning. Uh, my name is Declan Tanzi. I am a fifth grade social studies teacher at Cameron College Prep. And I think on behalf of the team, we just want to reiterate our thanks to Dr. Nic Nicholas for uh, being the inaugural teacher of this pilot. It's been a really wonderful experience, and, and to Lipscomb as well. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Jared Hum, who's a computer technology teacher at Jerry Baxter. And uh, we met after a particularly long day at school, and we were kind of talking about the issues that our schools face, and it was probably just a you know an ordinary Tuesday. The students weren't exactly 100% uh, behaving, so we said, okay, let's focus on school climate. And um, what that basically means is uh, the quality and character of the school, how students talk to one another, how teachers talk to students, how teachers talk among the staff. And we came up with a couple of ideas for how we'd look at school climate, and we met throughout the semester and, and basically came to a couple of uh, pretty uh, specific conclusions. Um, and we also looked at the tools that schools use to foster a positive climate. So for example, Jerry Baxter has started to use an online uh, program called Live School, uh, which is something that a lot of schools are using. It's basically an online behavior system. And it keeps track of all the positive behaviors and all the negative behaviors of a school. Uh, my school, Cameron College Prep, uses Kickboard, which is a very similar program, just a different name and kind of different ownership. And we were able, through different approaches, to come up with some uh, pretty basic conclusions about what makes for a good climate. And those things are uh, student accountability, students feel responsible for the way they behave, very clear expectations uh, for how students should behave, and positive interactions, not just among students, but in the way that teachers talk to students and teachers talk to each other. So it was a really uh, exciting experience and I look forward to continuing to work with Jared uh, on this project. Okay, Michelle. I'm Michelle Lucas. I'm the literacy coach at Thurgood Marshall Middle School, and I had the opportunity of working with the wonderful Mindy Norman from KIPP Academy. Mindy and I um, hit it off initially, immediately. We were both um, so passionate about literacy, and so we chose as our problem um, the assessment and dissemination, streamlining the assessment and dissemination uh, process for literacy results. And we chose that because it's so critical for teachers to have the information as early as possible so they can start making instructional decisions that will best um, impact the students in the classroom. And so um, together we I brought things from Metro and from Thurgood Marshall specifically um, to KIPP and also learned, got a, quite a bit of information from KIPP, processes that we did not have in Metro. And so together we feel like we have worked out a pretty good um, solution. So hopefully we will be able to start implementing um, this solution, if you will. We're very excited to begin that process. And we certainly will keep in contact and um, continue to solve all the world's problems with the education. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, Misty. Um, my name is Misty Caldwell. Um, I'm from Kip, Kip Academy, and I'm also a founding teacher there. And I'm not going to say my partner. I'm going to say my co-collaborator, um, Kathy, um, from Thurgood Marshall. We're both fifth grade teachers, and we noticed that with parents, that was our key. We wanted to make sure that parents are also kind of collaborators in their child's education. And we noticed that with fifth grade, it's a transitional year into middle school, and parents are really involved in the education of their children in elementary school, but it phases out into middle school. And so we realized that even though we're at two different schools, public and charter, there are three things that remain the same no matter what. The first one, and I'm going to have you put up one finger with me, the first one is first impressions are important. It's really important the way that you present yourself at the beginning. Um, I know that at public schools, at Kathy's school in particular, they have open house. At ours, we do home visits. So we go into the kids' homes and we meet with the parents and we kind of set the stage there. Second, thank you. The second one is you need to take a second look at what really appeals to your parents, whether it's if you have a big ELL population, maybe providing Spanish to English classes, something like that to really make sure that you are tailoring the activities that you have to the parents that you serve. And then the third one. There we go. All right. Third is the three C's. We're talking about consistent communication. It's critical. Not just at the beginning of the year. Not just when things are good, but throughout the year. And our push was to move parents not just from being involved, which is a choice. You get to choose when you're in being involved, but really being engaged in their, their child's education. So that was our push. And so we are going to implement some of the things that we realized works at her school and at our school to be able to make sure that parents are more involved in their child's education and co-collaborators as well. There you go. Carly? Um, <clears throat> I'm Carly Driscoll. I'm a third year special education teacher at Jerry Baxter Middle School. I had the privilege of working with Dias Ban from Graymar and also um, Kaylin Stubner from KIPP Academy. Uh, we uh, got together and we started talking about issues at our schools and what we decided to focus on was consistency in what was being taught, not necessarily just in each grade, but also in each class. So uh, we had, before the core content standards, we had you know the big standards book that we all know about that uh, took everything apart into little tiny pieces and we had taught everything in isolation and, and tried to put it all back together and it was really complex and didn't really work so that's why we moved to the core content standards which uh, condenses everything together a lot more and um, and is much broader but then they also talk about um, people also talk about how every teacher should be a literacy teacher. We need to teach reading and math in every single class, including gym, including art, including um, you know social studies. And that's a really difficult thing for teachers to do because they're a social studies teacher, or they're a gym teacher, or they're an art teacher. And it's to teach literacy is a really broad and complex thing. So we actually looked at all the core content standards and then developed six. Uh, kind of condensed standards that we felt could be taught in every single grade, in every single class from kindergarten through 12th grade. And um, the six categories were you know, math, logic, uh, reading, uh, pre-vocational skills, self-expression, and written expression. And we took each of those six things and went three levels deep with it. We lo looked at what it would look like in kindergarten, in sixth grade, and in twelfth grade, and then developed a mock tracker to uh, that would stay in the student's portfolio that uh, every teacher would use every single year from kindergarten through twelfth grade. And then at the end of it, we looked at those six standards and we said, if the, if the student can do these six things, would they be ready for college or a vocation? And we all said yes. So um, consistency in class to class, grade to grade for the entirety of a child's education. So please keep in mind as they're talking, this is done over a period of about six weeks, okay, that they're working on this and putting things like that together. Kimberly? I'm going to answer, my name is Kimberly Vaughn. I teach seventh grade math at John Early Museum Magnet Middle School. My awesome partner is Sheena Newville uh, from Smithson Craighead Academy. She teaches uh, language arts seventh and eighth grade. Uh, you asked us two questions. I'm going to answer it in a different order. Uh, I, I just want to say that this uh, experience was so wonderful. 
It was very enriching, and not only did I not, not only did I learn from my partner, but when we had discussions in the evening, I learned a lot, and even when we did our presentations. This is a great time right here in Nashville, and, and, and just being a part of this is something that just gives me goosebumps. Because Nashville's in uh, a movement of trying to reform and learning from our partners at charter schools and then having an innovation zone within the district is something that's so awesome. And um, it's, it's really something to watch as Nashville grows. Uh, with the charter community and I think that's something because we are trying to reform there are great things that are being done in the district as well as charter schools so um, what I learned I learned a lot of best practices um, we collaborated I um, left with teacher resources um, new friends to talk to we were a high energy group and it was it was really great the problem um, <coughs> that we research uh, is managing student behavior in a, in a diverse learning environment. And the diverse learning environment uh, that we are talking about, um, necessarily at my school, we have two extremes. We have students who are going there to go straight to Hume Fogg who are um, overachievers or ranked very high. And then we have students who, uh, we have a large exceptionally up population and um, they're struggling. So how do we uh, meet both of those needs and then also try to stamp out the behavior so that it does not impede the learning of others. Uh, at, her, at Sheena School, uh, we discuss behavior as well. Our schools handle behavior effectively, but we want to look at how to handle it efficiently and how to eradicate repeated violations. Uh, so that's what we did, and uh, we did it in two tiers. Sheena uh, looked at uh, the classroom, and I uh, did the part of school-wide. <laughs> and uh, what we came up with was, um, in both schools, and we want to employ this, is uh, doing character counts, building the character of the student. Um, we're trying to move away from the word discipline, but trying to uh, support the student in a way that they can continue to grow. Uh, there's also um, a tracking system that Sheena has, which I'm going to use, and that was really good. The kids can even track their own behavior, and they can make their own avatars. I was like, oh my gosh, my, my 14 year old daughter's gonna love this, okay? <laughs> so that's something that I'm taking from her that I'm going to use. Uh, this, that was totally awesome. And then there's a master teacher, uh, was another resource that talks about every single behavior, like down to like the agitator, the arguer, it, you know, it was just so awesome. And on the school wide uh, part, which was what I was charged with, um, we have what's called support teams within the district, but it needs to be fine-tuned a little bit, especially when it comes to behavior, and in particular behavior at my school and uh, some at Sheena's school, to have a behavior support team. And instead of having the usual behavior cycle where the, there's a classroom disruption, the student is sent out because, with, with a referral, the student goes to the office, may be suspended, misses out on classroom instruction, falls behind in class. When he, when he or she returns to class, he's disruptive again because he doesn't know the material is trying to avoid it. So we looked at a way to break the cycle and uh, instead of saying behavior cycle, let's go to behavior process or change. So if you have the behavior support system, uh, the way that that goes about Student is, uh, you know, classroom disruption, but you move into uh, referral. The student is not removed, but refer for a behavior support team, and within five days that should be called. Uh, after that, if the student is uh, suspended out of school or in school, uh, they have to it's mandatory that they go to school. Now some schools have twilight school, but not every school. Twilight school is, is uh, when students are suspended or so forth in the district, and they can attend school in the evening so that they don't get behind. Uh, but the behavior support team brings together those people necessary to help the student be successful in school. And so there's a tracking, and as they go through this, they're supported. The behavior support team is convened with the parent, maybe, uh, the psychologists or those people necessary to help the student uh, perform well in school. And as they move through that process, um, 
they are supported, their behavior is not repeated, they're not behind in school, and it's a continuing uh, process of monitoring them and supporting them. So that is what we did. Okay. Alana? Um, my partner and I, Christine Cope, she's not here today. She is on a camping trip with uh, students at KIPP. My name is Luana Baltimore. I am currently teaching fifth grade at Thurgood Marshall. Our topic was what do great schools do to maintain optimum learning environments? And what we both looked at was how is it that when you go into different schools, you see different things going on in different classrooms? At the beginning of the day, in, um, in different classrooms, you may see students sitting down doing morning work or daily review work. But in the classroom across the hall, kids are running around. So we looked at what did what do great schools do, and we found out that most of the great schools, one of the things they do is they make sure the kids start the day off right. You have what you call prime time. That's when your audience is at the greatest um, potential peak or the you have their attention the most so we looked at um, we transferred that over to the classroom and prime time in the classroom is when the kids first come in in the morning you want to make sure you have some type of morning activity some type of task for them to do so that was one of the things we looked at to make sure another thing we looked at was um, what do great schools do they set high expectations um, um, with procedures and making sure that all kids don't um, want to give up on and on what their morning tasks uh, and doing the day tasks are, and so those are some of the things that we kind of looked at. Okay, all right. One of our evenings together uh, was after your site visits were done, and that was an interesting discussion because you all came back with some aha moments after you visited in one other schools. Let me just open it up to the group. Uh, what about the site visit process was beneficial to you? What did you learn in particular that was helpful when you visited one another's schools? Luana? I went into KIPP and I went into um, a classroom that I actually, I could not leave. She was teaching um, a reading class, but she used music, the up-to-date music that the kids enjoyed. When I say every child was engaged, they were. And she had the reading sheets, same standards that I'm using with a book. She didn't have a book, but she used music. And I was so drawn into the lesson, I could not leave her. And she's right there, so I really want to commend her on that. Um, so just to seeing them use the same curriculum I was, but without textbook and all the fluff and, and all that, it was, it was a personal relevant moment for me seeing that um, with that particular teacher. Okay, Misty? Um, I would say with the site visits, when you're at school, you're in your own bubble, and you forget that there are other schools out there and schools that are different and schools that have great ideas. You get in your own bubble and you forget things like that. And one thing I noticed when we went to Thurgood Marshall was the school was so nice and clean and it had a good feeling when you walked into it. It was nice and orderly. And that was kind of different from the school where I teach at. We, If you've ever been to Kip Academy, it's kind of a rundown old building and um, you know we have the air conditioner things in the wall and if you want the, the air to turn on you do this to a kid and they turn on the air so it was really different like it was a different feeling going in and I noticed too like a difference in like the class sizes and so when I went into Kathy's classroom she had about 20 or so students in class and my class has about like 33 students so there was a big difference it was a different feeling but I think that it was really good to be able to go out and to see a different school in a different place and to get ideas because a lot of times as teachers and I'm sure a lot of times as business people, you kind of get stuck in your own bubble and you forget about the good positive things that are out there and the good positive things you're doing as well. Okay. Carly? I was, um, you, you just did a lot of things that I was going to say. Oh, perfect. Well. <laughs> but, um, I think one of, my, one of my partners, Caitlin, who also works at Kip Academy, and she said something really good that I would, I would want to repeat here. And she said that what she realized was that there are good teachers everywhere. And I thought that was a really good thing to say and something that I agreed with. Because I went to KIPP Academy and I observed a few people and, and walked around and I felt really good in the school. And, and I've, every teacher that I saw, I was like, wow, this is a really good teacher. And I was engaged in what they were doing and watching how they were managing classes. And I took like five pages of notes of different things. And yeah, she's right, is that there, and maybe, one of the points that I think all of us here are 
or ma are trying to make is that there are really good teachers everywhere. Okay. As we wrap this up, we just have time maybe for one more question. Let me throw out, uh, as you've been through this process now, could it, a couple of you respond to the benefits that you gleaned? Kimberly did a bit, but some of the rest of you. How has this helped you as a teacher? Uh -huh. I think the, the best ideas in education are stolen. Um, maybe I should say shared because it's collaborative. <laughs> but, Better word. Um, <laughs> I th you know, our, our panel's been talking about it. when you're teaching in your classroom every day, it's very insular, you and your students every day. And it was wonderful to get out of your own classroom, to go to a different school, to work with other teachers, and see that there are best practices in a public school, there are best practices in a charter school, there are things on the district level that are working. And just hearing from, from Todd about what Summit is doing well, we should translate that to what Nashville should be doing well. Um, when it comes down to it, these are our students, these are all of our students, and uh, whatever best practices there are across the country, we need to learn how to implement them in a way that works for Nashville. Um, and so I think the whole idea of this program was best practices are shared, and there's a reason that they are really effective, and in whatever ways that we can implement them, um, we should. And that is a great note to end on. Would you show your appreciation to these folks again, please? Pam, if you'll stay where you are, we'll let Mark come and close this out. Thanks, Dr. Nicholas, um, and thank you for leading this conversation, this group today, uh, and throughout the past several months. I want to follow up on something that Todd, Todd Dixon said um, uh, from my own experience working in the legislature in the 1990s in Tennessee. I mean, it really is true. In the whole debate about whether we ought to have charter schools, the main rationale for it was that they were going to be innovative, and we were all going to learn from it. And of course, in particular, the public school systems were going to learn from it. And then we forgot about that. And now, um, and so I just want to reiterate how remarkable this conversation today, that this culminated over the work that you all have done over several months, is. Uh, it is at least 10 years overdue, and some could say 20 years overdue, that this is happening in Nashville. And I think Alan made a good point. Now we need to make sure that this isn't the only conversation, this isn't the last work between the charter teachers and the district teachers, but we figure out ways to roll this forward and get more people involved so we all can learn the shared lessons. So um, I wanted to reiterate that point. The other thing is that we are uh, now wrapping up a school year, which means we all get distracted and are thinking about other things, but uh, leadership is critical. We see it here on the stage with these teachers. We know principals are critical, and our Board of Education is critical as well. In this summer, we're going to have a school board election in Nashville. Five of the nine districts are up. I want to recognize David Fox, uh, former District 8 uh, school board member and chair of the school board. Uh, District 8 is the Green Hills area. I do see one candidate in the room, uh, Margaret Dolan, who's running for District 9, which is uh, Bellevue, Westmead, and Sylvan Park, and uh, Charlotte Park as well. So I encourage you to pay attention to the school board elections, and obviously if you live in Davidson County, in one of those five districts, I encourage you to get out and vote and get involved. It is a critical moment for our schools moving forward. And the last point I want to say is that we do have a partnership with NECAT, which is a nonprofit that runs three government channels on Comcast in Davidson County. They run 9, 10, and 19. 10 uh, is an educational channel, and they are videotaping the program today. And once they finish editing it, it will be running on channel 10. So I encourage you all to, to look at that. And we'll also upload a highlight clip to YouTube as well. So thank you all for being here today for this important conversation right before Memorial Day. Have a great holiday weekend.